Helen Little Family Comprehensive Cancer Centre Showcase event. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see you. Such a great crowd here. Uh, I want to thank um, Anne Crow and her team for putting this together. I know it was uh, complicated logistically. Yeah. <laughs> Done this, and it's really the opportunity for us to thank you for all your support and for you to meet uh, the faculty and hear about the programs that you support and uh, talk to them you know, one on one in closed up sessions. And uh, if you don't like the progress they've made, there's a chance for you to kick their butts. It's <laughs> 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 not motivational piece. <laughs> um, I just extend a special welcome uh, to members of the Diddle family who are joining us today uh, Jackie and Dan Sapir. <laughs> You know, the Dillow family support has been really important for the development of our cancer centre, so thank you so much for coming, it's great to see you. So I really hope you enjoy the afternoon. We have a plenary session planned first, in which uh, Susan Desmond Hellman will talk about her fantastic achievements uh, at uh, Genentech and how her vision for translational medicine uh, within, the, within the cancer centre. And I'm going to give you a sort of uh, my view of why it's so difficult to develop cancer drugs and some of the challenges that we face and how we intend to address those challenges within the faculty within the cancer centre. And then Jim Wells is going to give you some sort of nerdy techno stuff about how uh, <laughs> his approach uh, to developing cancer uh, drugs, which is highly innovative and, and really exciting. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our Chancellor, uh, Susan Desmond Hellman. Uh, probably most of you all know by now that as President of uh, drug development at Genentech, she brought to market uh, several of the most successful cancer drugs in history. And uh, I think I referred to her at a previous meeting as the god of drug development, which was quoted in the Chronicle, I thought. <laughs> uh, but uh, she's done a wonderful job developing uh, some fantastic uh, uh, potent drugs uh, in her previous uh, life. And actually, the development of her septin has really changed the paradigm by which uh, we think about drug development, because it was really aimed at a subset of patients that we expected uh, to respond to the drug. And really, that ushered in the era of uh, personalized uh, medicine. So uh, we're looking forward to that. We're all delighted and, and extremely honored that she is our chancellor. And it's my pleasure to introduce you today. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. And, and let me just add my welcome to everyone for coming today. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Um, I am... Uh, yes. I'm there. Good. Good. We're in shape. Uh, so, so despite um, that kind introduction uh, by Frank, what, what my intention today is um, not to celebrate the successes that I and my colleagues had in my work at, at Genentech but to challenge us, um, because as, as much as I think that some great things have happened in oncology, I think we should and could do much, much better. And so I think you'll see in the three talks that you hear during this session, um, what, what I hope will uh, hope get you thinking about, and more importantly, um, share with you a vision for how I think we could do better in uh, translational research here at UCSF. Um, so here's how I want to uh, set up my agenda for, for my talk. I do think the period of time between 1997 and 2001 was potentially a five-year period of time in oncology that will go down in history as one of the most productive periods of time if measured by Food and Drug Administration approval for new cancer drugs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why I think that and how I define good. Um, a, a couple comments about the state of cancer research today, and if, if 97 to 2001 were the golden years, I, I'd love to challenge ourselves here at UCSF to say, what, what could make 2010 to 2020 the platinum decade? Uh, we're at an unprecedented time in science and medicine, and I, I like to think about um, our ability at UCSF to make a difference. And when there's concern, or you hear concern about the state of product development today, or the state of cancer research today, we ought to be asking, how can we lead? How can we change some of the, the challenges? And how can we address those challenges and make life better for patients in the future? So here, here's why I define 97 to 2001, from my point of view, as, um, at least in my life, the best time ever in oncology. Um, here are three products and their approval dates. Um, Rituxan or Rituximab approved in 1997, Herceptin uh, or Trastuzumab in 1998, and then Gleevec uh, in 2001. 
these are three products that when I think about um, product development in cancer and what good looks like, I think these are three great examples. And so I'm going to take a minute to describe each of these three and why they meet my definition of good. The first um, uh, criteria that I have is that there's a major unmet need. So patients were waiting who didn't have a solution for their issue. Um, you're gonna hear from my colleagues um, that bio-driven, uh, biomarker-driven patient selection is an essential piece of how we think about oncology and how. Extending survival, do patients live longer when they're treated with new therapies? And very important, even if you live longer, what's the price you pay? Are the, are the medicines well tolerated or do they cause a lot of side effects? So let's start with um, rituxan or rituximab. So before rituxan was approved in 1997, aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was curable in only a small number of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients with the use of chemotherapy. And in fact, a preferred way of treating patients that I use myself in practice was the uh, approach called watch and wait. So why on earth with a cancer patient would an oncologist choose to watch and wait? Well, the reason would be if your remedies, the chemotherapy, was actually worse than the benefit. So the side effects in many patients, particularly elderly patients, outweighed the potential benefit. And so watch and wait meant that you and the patient kept talking about was it the lymphoma bad enough to actually make the therapy worth the side effects? After rituxan, the, there was an increase in overall survival among patients with aggressive lymphoma by 23%. The cure rate significantly increased in many patients. And it was one of the first examples of a therapy that helped turn non-Hodgkin's lymphoma into a chronic disease. There are some patients who can come back in and be retreated over and over again, not necessarily curing their cancer, but keeping it in remission over a long period of time. And the consequences, the side effects in most patients were tolerable enough to actually do that, to come in every six or 12 months and to get more medicine. So for me, this first monoclonal antibody approved for cancer changed the way that caregivers and their patients could face a disease like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, made a disease that was really frightening into a manageable, potentially chronic disease, something that is a game changer. Then Herceptin, one year later, in 1998, is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Before that, a caregiver said to a patient, you have HER2 positive or HER2 driven breast cancer and you worried more. I took care of many patients in my career who had HER2 positive breast cancer and I hated that discussion. The only thing worse than saying I'm really scared along with the patient is that I had no remedy. This particular form of cancer, when it had spread, was a death sentence for most women. After Herceptin, there was a change of prognosis. A near 20% difference in disease-free survival at, at five years and a reduction of the risk of cancer recurrence by 52%. Three years after the most important early stage trial with Herceptin, 85% of the patients were cancer free. That's what good looks like. Good looks like patients who are cancer free for a disease that only the patients, about 20% of women with breast cancer, receive Herceptin. For 80% of the women with breast cancer, they don't have this marker and they're not subjected to this medicine. So personalized medicine, personalized therapy, was really begun with Herceptin. And the third example for me of what good looks like, and just to show I'm not parochial, I did not work on Gleevec. Uh, I worked on the other two medicines, but I think Gleevec is a fantastic advance, and so does Time Magazine, uh, who, who talked about this new ammunition in the war against cancer. Um, before Gleevec, only 30% of patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia survived five years after diagnosis, and treatment had very serious side effects. After, when you treat early, complete response was possible in 98% of patients. Think about a medicine that does that. And nearly 90% five-year survival rate in patients. I mean, this is truly transformative. And in the case of Gleevec, this is an oral medicine, well-tolerated pill for a very serious form of cancer. 
So I put forward these three examples because I think these examples challenge me to say, why don't we do this all the time? Why, why isn't this business as usual for cancer? Um, so I think that's not business as usual. And in fact, when you think about that kind of opportunity for patients, I would submit that cancer research today is too slow. I'm in a hurry, patients are waiting. It's too expensive, it's too inefficient. Most cancer products fail. Um, and most importantly, if you're in a company, if you're trying to make it a go in biotech or pharmaceutical company who bring these types of products to commercialization, it is much too uncertain. And so one of the things I worry about is lowered investments in cancer product development. And the reason is that uncertainty. It's, it is not possible for us to always predict which of the medicines that go from the lab into the clinic are going to succeed. So that uncertainty from a business perspective lowers investment. From a patient perspective, it means the clinical trials, we don't know what the outcomes will be. So one example of the too slow is the clinical trials that were done uh, eventually at Genentech, um, but came out of work that was published by Judith Bookman in 1971 in the New England Journal of Medicine, when he hypothesized that you cut off blood vessels in cancer, and you could help cancer patients. Well, in fact, it took until 1997 before the clinical trials were initiated, and then only in 2004, approval. Now, I'd like to see more advances in my lifetime. This kind of a timeline is not okay. We need to be much more efficient and quick in our clinical trials. It's too expensive. As a product developer, as a person who was making cancer drugs, I wanted to see headlines that say, helping patients, improving survival, making life better, and too often, I would see cost of cancer drugs to force hard decisions, rising drug prices hard to swallow. But all is not lost. I think there's glimmers of hope. I actually am optimistic, despite this challenge of too slow, too expensive, because I'm seeing more and more of these targeted therapies, these personalized remedies for cancer. And I'll, I'll provide for you just four examples that are today, not historical, but today examples using inhibition of BRAF, another marker for selected melanomas. Now you all know melanoma could be a very difficult cancer to treat, and in fact, we can target specific forms of melanoma for BRAF inhibition. There's a pathway called the hedgehog pathway that is very important in actually all basal cell carcinomas and some forms of childhood brain cancer called medulloblastoma. There's an inhibitor for that pathway. There's a specific inhibitor for some forms of lung cancer, targeted personalized therapy. And finally, one of the most difficult forms of breast cancer, even in the area of perception to treat, is what's called triple negative or basal cancer, and there are some new inhibitors that are being developed for that kind of breast cancer. So I think there's some signs of hope, some glimmers that this will be, in fact, business as usual for cancer. So what about the future? And specifically, how can we contribute at UCSF to making this a better story and a future where in all of our lifetimes, we're gonna see more exciting um, things happen in cancer research? Well, here are my metrics for success. <clears throat> Has to be faster has to get to patients cheaper. We're pricing ourselves out of business in the cancer business. It has to be less expensive to develop and to commercialize new cancer therapies. And, and I put third, but most importantly, it has to be more predictable. We have to be able to say, look, from a science perspective, spend your time on this and not that. From a business perspective, invest in these products and not those. Um, and from a society perspective, that these products can get out to the world without spending so much money and time. There's 861 cancer drugs in development, so we have a lot of substrate. And you can just see from this number in this slide, it is impossible for us to invest in all of these. So selecting the ones that are going to work becomes more and more important. I want to offer four ways of thinking about how we get there and how we do better. And you're gonna hear more about that from my colleagues. Discovery, we need basic work, we need more basic science. What exactly 
is the most important driver for particularly those cancers driven by a single pathway. Development, clinical trials. We need some technical breakthroughs in clinical trials. You hear about arrays and MRI and lots of technical advances that we use to, to understand biology, but we need some surrogates. We need some clues that we can use in patients. How can we tell which patients will live longer? We can't wait 10 or 20 years for the answer in clinical trials. And we need to have better outcomes on safety that are measurable early on and comparative effectiveness. What is the best therapy for that patient at that moment? Um, and we need to make sure that the right product reaches the right patient at the right time and is affordable. If we make new cancer products and they don't get to patients, it doesn't count. So access has become a very important part of how we all think about uh, new cancer therapies and new <coughs> development in cancer therapies. So I want to say a couple words about UCSF and why I'm so excited to be at UCSF and here today at this particular moment in time. So as new chancellor, you can imagine I don't have a lot of time for continuing medical education, but I squeezed in four days in April to attend the American Association for Cancer Research, which was a huge thrill for me. And I wanted to tell you how UCSF, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center was represented there, just so you know what you're associated with. There were more than 17,000 attendees at this premier cancer research meeting, and there were 7,743 presentations. Over 3,000 of those represented work from UCSF faculty. And one of the highlights for me was our own Frank McCormick was the uh, program committee chairperson and spoke at the opening plenary session. Laura, Alan, and Lisa each participated in three different plenary sessions, so there were three, which was a really great <coughs> program. I was frantically taking notes for each of these, and we were well, well represented. There was a special session to recognize the 2009 Nobel Prize winners, so our own Liz Blackburn and Carol uh, Greider from Hopkins were both there and got special recognition. And the incoming president of the American Association of Cancer Research, again, is Elizabeth Blackburn um, for 2010-11. Uh, so it was all UCSF all the time. Uh, and and uh, I think that's really a, a testimony. I'm going to ask you this. I'm sure Frank has picked the best presentations, not with any populism. I should have said. But it was the best and the brightest. And we were extremely well represented. So I can think of no better time in science or medicine and no better place than the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center to be right now. And I hope you enjoy the afternoon and uh, the program. And so here's my final slide. Um, our opportunity is to uncover the key drivers of cancer, to take novel approaches, rapidly translate from the clinic to the lab, have some careers for folks here at UCSF that can add technical expertise on these <coughs> clinical trials to be more efficient in our translation. So here's my goal that any patient who's told you have cancer expects to live a meaningful life. And I think that's a goal that's in our sights. So thanks again for coming. And thanks. thanks a lot, Sue, that was wonderful. And we'll be taking questions at the end of the uh, plenary, so uh, hold your applause for that, please. Uh, it was a great meeting, I must say. <laughs> it was fun. The uh, theme of the AACR meeting was conquering cancer uh, through discovery research, because I think it's my belief and the president of the ACR's belief uh, that we really need to be more innovative and more creative in finding new ways of understanding cancer and of developing uh, clinical research protocols, as, as Sue said. So that was the theme of the meeting. And those of you who are interested in getting actually seeing some of our faculty presenting on webcasts, you can actually go to the AACR website and you'll see uh, many of our, our faculty uh, uh, on there. So I'm going to um, pick up uh, the thread that um, Sue started to try and drill down a little bit more specifically about the challenges uh, of uh, cancer therapy. And so sort of framing this, uh, I was thinking back to when uh, Andy Grove was very involved in our, our prostate cancer program and frequently came to our discussions about new compounds that were being developed in, in prostate cancer. And over time, he developed uh, Andy Grove's laws, uh, which were painfully and repetitively true at that time. That is that new cancer drugs only work on 10% of patients, and at that time, uh, they were sort of unpredictably, uh, it was unpredictable which 10% would benefit. 
And also, if they do work, they only work for a, a, a short period of time, we said for six months. So these are the sort of the two bullet points I want to drill down on and discuss why it is so hard to develop cancer drugs and how we can address uh, these two major issues. Uh, another problem is that as we understand more and more about cancer, we identify more and more uh, proteins that drive cancer and play a causal role in cancer. And we often think, well, if we can hit that protein, we'll have clinical benefit. But unfortunately, the technology of drug development is sort of way behind the genetics and the biology. So often we discover targets that the drug industry simply can't touch because they're not druggable, as we say. And we can discuss at the end what that actually means, but the problem is they're sitting there as targets that we can't do anything about it. And that actually is the majority of proteins that cause cancer cannot be attacked with conventional uh, uh, antibody therapy or small molecule therapy. So we need to be more innovative in the drug discovery uh, world as well as in basic research uh, and in clinical discovery. And Jim Wells will give a wonderful presentation on an example of innovative approaches to these uh, undroppable targets. Also, we need to think harder about totally new approaches to treating cancer, because it's my feeling, even with optimizing all the systems and knowing what we know, uh, we're not going to get to the point of, uh, of curing major solid uh, cancers uh, effectively using current technology. So we have to keep thinking of new approaches and new, uh, new innovations. So Andy Grove's Law 1, that you know, new cancer drugs only work on subsets of patients, say, say 10%. How do we deal with this? Well, in the examples that uh, Sue just mentioned, uh, we have drugs that actually target uh, genes which cause cancer in that specific 10% subset. So in some cases, we actually know up front which 10% we expect to respond because the drug aims specifically at that subset of patients. And again, Receptin uh, is a fantastic case of that. The drug was only tested on women that have HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. So we focused on the 10% where we expect the drug to work because we know how the drug works and that's how it was developed huge benefit to the development process and to all the patients that didn't have to be exposed to the drug uh, when it wouldn't have had any benefit. Same is true of the, uh, the um, BRAF inhibitor that uh, was developed by my ex-postdoc Ian Bolag uh, at uh, Plexicon. Melanoma is caused by several different uh, driving uh, genes. One of them is called BRAF. This drug is only, tar only targets BRAF. So those were the patients uh, in which this drug was tested and uh, they have shown really dramatic benefit. Uh, and believe back as we've heard is another example. So in some cases, we know what we're doing, we know the target drives the bus, and we know if we hit that target, we'll have benefit. But unfortunately, that is not the sort of general case at this, uh, this time. So the other approach is to treat patients with drugs that we're not sure exactly how they work, and then analyze who responded and who didn't respond, based on uh, analyzing tumor material from the patient. Now this is complicated and technically very difficult, I'll get back to that in just a moment, but it has been done, and actually I think the first person to do it uh, successfully was uh, Laura Vanderveer, who we just recruited from the National, uh, sorry, the Netherlands uh, uh, Cancer Institute, uh, and um, is she here in the audience today? Yeah. She's over here. Yeah. Please say welcome to Laura Vanderveer. <laughs> Thank you for having me over here. She's our new uh, Director of Applied Genomics. So Laura and her team uh, analyzed expression profiles, that is, all the genes expressed in breast cancers from a large number of, uh, of breast cancer patients who were being exposed to therapy, uh, and measured literally hundreds of thousands of data points on each patient, and then analyzed uh, retrospectively which ones are likely to respond uh, and progress and which ones would not. And she defined out of all that haystack of information a subset of 70 genes which predict who will progress on, in, in treatments and who will not. Uh, and not content with that, uh, she took this signature uh, into a commercial uh, setting and developed a thing called Mammoprint, which is the signature, and took it through the FDA and got approval uh, to use this as a test, which I think was the first test ever approved based on the gene expression profile of a tumor. So we can now look at the expression profile from a tumor and predict the clinical outcome based on the kind of te technology that Laura uh, pioneered. Uh, Phil Febo, we've also just recruited from uh, Duke University. Phil, are you there? Not here. Uh, he's not here, but he will be presenting in this, uh, in this room, actually, uh, in the breakout session on prostate cancer. Phil is doing the same kind of thing in prostate cancer, looking for uh, markers of response in tremendous technical detail to figure out who's going to respond to drugs and who won't, uh, and then uh, going forward, we can use that information uh, to stratify patients to tailor them to the right uh, therapy. Uh, and there are many other uh, examples of investigators at UCSF who have done this kind of analysis. Just want to draw your attention to Daphne House Coven and Mike Prados, who formed a collaboration with investigators at UCLA and Harvard and all over the country, actually, 
to identify and try and determine why some patients with glioblastoma respond to a particular drug and others don't. And they uh, came up with a seminal discovery that a particular gene <coughs> present in some patients defeats the effect of a drug. So those patients with that particular gene should not be treated with that drug alone, but in a, take a different approach. So, and there are many other examples I haven't got time to, to go on about. Okay, so um, this, that was sort of basically some, some ideas relating to why, uh, how we can deal with the fact that only subsets of patients uh, respond. Uh, when they do respond, they tend to fail, as I'm sure you're all aware. And there are at least two different reasons for this. Uh, in the first case, um, this would be a case in which the drug really hits the target and the target drives the bus, the, dr the drug has a major effect, patients show dramatic responses, but they relapse because drug-resistant clones emerge uh, as the patients are on therapy. This has been the paradigm for actually for chemotherapy pretty much forever, but it's been really well defined at the molecular level uh, by Neil Shah, who's a new, relatively new recruit to the UCSF, <laughs> uh, who did some seminal work with Charles Sawyers identifying mechanisms of drug resistance uh, to um, imatinib. The problem is these drug resistant clones actually exist in the patient before you even treat the patient with the drug. It's just the sheer nature of a large number of tumor cells in a patient. So it's sort of inevitable that, it, that a drug that hits one target uh, will kill most of the tumor cells, but drug-resistant clones will emerge. And in theory, that can be dealt with with a second drug that hits the uh, emerging clones. That's how the satin, another drug for the same target, was, was uh, approved. So this is like the HIV sort of uh, paradigm. We really need to hit with at least two drugs up front uh, to wipe out the drug-resistant clones and the adaptive resistant clones up front. And that's something which uh, the, the world is sort of coming around to, but it makes life complicated. Uh, but that is the hope that uh, we, can, we can defeat that problem. The second problem is um, more complicated. It's what I refer to as the whack-a-mole effect. That is, in a, in a complicated um, uh, network of, um, of, of relationships inside a cell, uh, we find that if we hit one target in this network and turn it down, something else pops up, and we then have to hit that one. So we're sort of constantly chasing the ability of cancer cells to adapt to the drug. So adaptive resistance is different to drug resistance, but it's a problem. And this has been worked on by Mark Boasa and Michael Korn uh, and others here uh, in the cancer <coughs> center. So here's an example where we have a, in this complicated network, we think this particular protein is on fire and driving uh, the tumor. So we can think we can stop that happening by blocking downstream uh, with a drug that prevents uh, that cascade. Well, that has an effect, but unfortunately, uh, Michael and others discovered, uh, another protein pops up, which is now taking fire. So that's created another problem. So the solution to this, then, is that uh, we need to hit both of these uh, proteins at once. And this is becoming another paradigm in, in cancer treatment, that we need to understand how cancer cells can adapt to one drug through the whack-a-mole problem and then hit the second one at the same time. Now, that requires a really deep understanding of these very complicated uh, signaling pathways. And that's what many of us are, are actually working on in the labs to try and predict what happens when we knock down one target, how the other ones pop up, and how we can anticipate that uh, by hitting uh, two or three different parts of these networks at once. So this is complicated, and it makes the process of developing drugs you know, even more complicated because developing two drugs at once sort of squares the difficulty of the whole process, not just technically, but also commercially. So for example, in this case, uh, AstraZeneca has a MET inhibitor, Merck has an AKT inhibitor. These are competitive companies, and yet you can imagine that this approach will only work if they work together to combine the drugs into one protocol. And amazingly, that's what they are doing. The uh, clinical groups from the two different rival companies decided that neither drug will work alone, let's work together. So for the first time, maybe in history, <laughs> a combination of drugs from two different companies will be co-developed uh, to pre prevent this kind of whack-a-mole thing. So that's, I think, encouraging, but it does make life much more complicated in terms of predicting side effects and, and so on. So what to do? So a combination therapy of several drugs overcomes drug resistance and whack-a-mole problem but it creates difficulties in the clinic. This requires really sophisticated clinical trials infrastructure to measure the effects of these drugs in patients in real time uh, through imaging and biomarkers uh, and so on. And many of us here are working on developing the clinical trials infrastructure uh, so that we can really take advantage of this knowledge and, uh, and benefit patients in this way. 
and Eric Small has led the uh, Investigational Therapeutics Initiative, and Serena Nada, also recently recruited uh, from Vanderbilt, is doing the sort of informatics uh, that goes with it, and there are many other uh, members of the, uh, the, uh, the center involved in this process. Extremely complicated, uh, it's extremely expensive and, and difficult to do, but this is where we are, and, we're, and all the centers around the country are trying to do this. I think we are uh, at the front of this pack. So other approaches are to do things completely differently. One, okay, small molecules, antibodies have these, um, have these complications which we'll work through. Uh, how about a different approach? Cancer vaccines, for example, has been on the table for a long time. Uh, Larry Fong is one of our investigators working in this area. Eric again uh, led actually the clinical trials that led to approval of Provenge, uh, the first, first uh, cancer vaccine ever approved by the FDA. So it's been a long time coming, but there's sort of one, one uh, point on the board in favor of this technology, which would be completely different if ever successful. Uh, there's a technology I'll come back to in just a moment called interfering uh, uh, RNA or small interfering RNA, which could change everything. I'll come back to that. Uh, and uh, we need novel chemistry to try and uh, attack these undruggable uh, targets that I mentioned. Again, keep on showing that Jim Wells are two of our sort of pioneers in this area. Plus, there's always the opportunity for some bright young dude or dudess <laughs> uh, to come up with a completely new way of thinking about treating uh, cancer. Uh, so we sort of really encourage uh, the, the students and postdocs to think differently, think out the box, and. Uh, challenge the uh, existing ways of doing things, and maybe someone will have an even better idea. Uh, so very briefly, this is something which I'm really sort of passionately interested in, and that is the possibility of turning off specific genes uh, in patients uh, using what's called siRNA or RNA interference. Now, this is technology that sort of swept in the biology field over the last few years. It was only discovered maybe 10 years ago, uh, and a Nobel Prize in medicine was given to Craig Mello and Andy Fire for this discovery in 2006. It's a technology in which um, one can take, and we do this in the lab about all the time, take a cell in the lab, we design a little bit of synthetic RNA which targets a particular gene that we want to get rid of in the cell, say HER2 new or PCR8 or a gene that drives cancer. We can put this little bit of RNA onto the cell and it'll turn that gene off specifically. So this is you know, quite staggering when we think about the potential of doing this and all of our labs do this all the time routinely. Five years ago, we never heard of it. It's technology which is Nobel worthy and has swept through the research labs in such a way that it's transformed the way we do research. Uh, but uh, I believe sometime in the near future, hopefully, this will be applied also in, uh, in our patients. And to this end, uh, with support from uh, Bruce and Martha Atwater, Atwater Foundation, uh, uh, Joe Gray, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Mark Davis from Caltech, and myself, too modest to show my own picture on this picture, <laughs> uh, are collaborating uh, to use this kind of technology uh, in, uh, in patients eventually to target uh, these genes which cause breast cancer. We've chosen these particular genes because these genes, we already know, play a major role in breast cancer, and we know that we can have clinical benefit by hitting these genes or these proteins with antibodies or with small molecules. So the question is, can we do the same thing uh, with a uh, it's RNA construct. The problem is, when you inject this stuff into, a, into the bloodstream, it, it gets broken down and disappears. It's hard to get it to the tumor. But our collaborator, Mark Davis, uh, recently published a paper in a top journal showing that in a clinical trial in humans, uh, you can get uh, sRNA delivered into uh, a tumor and see knocked down of the specific target from the systemic injection. So uh, this, in my view, is a tipping point in this field. This is a serious, proper clinical trial with an endpoint which can be measured in patients on study using a completely new technology which specifically knocks out one gene in the tumor. Now, I'm sure, I doubt it will have clinical benefit, and it may take five years uh, to develop, uh, but we want to be part of the uh, next, next revolution uh, if indeed uh, it does uh, come about. So in, in mice, for example, we can take an undruggable gene, such as this one called KRAS, inject into mice and get complete knockdown in, a liver, in, in living mice without any serious uh, side effects. So some of these pieces are in place. Now we need to really drill down and focus on this and see if we can develop this as a complementary or an alternative uh, platform to the traditional, more traditional uh, medicinal chemistry and antibody-based uh, therapy. So that's something which uh, we are uh, determined to try and uh, give, it, give it a go. And with the support from Bruce and Martha, we intend to do that in the next uh, couple of years. 
So that's all I wanted to say. Um, I will now hand over the podium to my colleague, uh, Jim Wells. I think you for you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. So, um, so Jim is the director of the UCSF Small Molecule Discovery Center. He received his BA degree uh, in biochemistry from UC Berkeley and a PhD from Washington State University and did postdoctoral studies uh, at Stanford University. Uh, he's in the Department of Biochemistry. Uh, he was the founding member of the Protein Engineering Department at Genentech, uh, where he worked for 16 years. Then he founded his own company, Synesis Pharmaceuticals, where he served as uh, president and chief scientific officer. Uh, and he developed a very novel strategy called uh, disulfide trapping or, or tethering uh, to take on some of these undruggable targets. Uh, so uh, Jim is, uh, joined UCSF a few years ago and is the Harry W. and Diana Hines Distinguished Professor in Pharmaceutical Sciences. Please uh, welcome Jim. Well, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here and tell you about some of the work uh, my lab is doing. I guess I'm supposed to be the technical nerd here on the podium. <laughs> um, I also noticed that of the three, all three of us actually came from industrial roots, which is kind of interesting when you think about people uh, transitioning from uh, their careers using they go directly into an academic thing. And I think that reflects the fact that at universities, especially like UCSF, there's a tremendous interest in taking what folks have learned from the industrial sector and bringing it here and bringing it back here to really innovate uh, these important problems like treating cancer. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited to, to be here and tell you some about um, some of the work that my lab has been up to. Um, uh, now it's a little bit morbid, I know, to think about cell death, but this is exactly what you want to do for a cancer cell. You want to understand how we can trigger this process so we can kill cancer cells. We'd like to understand that process so, so that we can tell that it's going on when we treat uh, patients with cancer drugs, that we're actually killing those cancer cells that we wish to. Uh, uh, that we wish to. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm not sure I've got the, there's directions here, but I'm not seeing to advance things. Oh, there we go. What happened? Oh, or this one, okay. Um, so let's see. Okay, so this is a model of a healthy uh, cell on the top, this sort of fuzzy beach ball. It's actually in a T cell. And when you treat it with a, a cancer drug or other uh, uh, death signals, uh, the cell undergoes this dramatic transformation to this kind of uh, bubbling, uh, bleeding kind of thing. And lots of stuff is going on beneath the, the, the envelope of this membrane. Lots of cellular changes are going on. And it turns out that they're being driven by a class of proteases that, that my group works on called caspases. Now, um, this process of uh, apoptosis, you think, well, why is it necessary? Actually, it's a natural phenomenon, and it's absolutely essential, because without it, uh, it's an altruistic uh, phenomenon for removing unwanted cells in development, for instance, we need to get rid of scaffolding cells, like a webbing between our fingers and things like that. That's a natural process of apoptosis that removes that. Um, and it's also important for, for removing de uh, a disease or um, a DNA damage cells, often precursors to, um, uh, to cancer itself. So it's the fundamental process by which we remove precancers, and in fact, most cancers figure out ways to block this so that it doesn't happen, or figure out ways that when you put a cancer drug on them, uh, they, can, they can avoid this apoptotic phenomenon. So then we as drug developers are trying to develop these synthetic triggers that can trigger this cancer phenomenon uh, in, 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 in these cells. And one of them ultimately leads to the activation of these death enzymes, known as caspases, which convert from an off state to an on state um, through a number of signaling cascades that I'll briefly show you and then lead to this apoptotic phenomenon. So at the end of all of this, whether, whether it's inhibiting uh, AKT or, or MEK or all of these other proliferative things, the final result we hope for is that these enzymes get activated and kill cancer cells selectively. Um, but it turns out that to do that it involves a long and bumpy road uh, to actually activate the caspases. For instance, it, most chemotherapy of drugs which would induce DNA damage or microtubule damage have to signal through a variety of different pathways 
Uh, first to this ATM, check two, into the P53, which is the alarm bell of the cell, DH3 proteins get produced, the punch holes in the mitochondria that release cytochrome C, the production of this first apoptosome complex known as, uh, as, as the apoptosome, and then activation of, of caspase 3. Many steps all along the way. And so cancer cells have learned how to avoid this stuff. For instance, they will, in some cases, mutate or downregulate these proteins here that are part of the activation pathway. Or they'll uh, change, for instance, break proteins like this BCL2 that will put breaks on the system so, so as to avoid it. And so a number of companies, uh, uh, Genentech, Abbott, a number of companies have got interested in directly activating these, these, these pathways through either inhibiting MDM2 or BCL2 or IEPs, for instance. And what my lab was interested in was the possibility that, hey, what about the possibility that we directly activate caspase 3 itself? Is that possible to do? Now, that has a, a, a lot of uh, ifs and buts because this, is, this would not be making an inhibitor. This would be making something that activates some, something else. Almost all drugs that we know about act as inhibitors. They, they block an activity. This is meant to turn something on. And we have evidence that this might be possible based on a lot of molecular um, studies my group has been doing over the last uh, 10 years. That these caspases actually flip back and forth between an on state and an off state in the cell. And if we could lock them in this on state long enough, they would actually uh, turn themselves on completely by autoproteolysis and remain in an on state. So the notion was is that maybe we could take these inactive forms of the caspases find compounds through screening that would uh, identify ways that we could lock them in the on state. And if we could do that, maybe we could induce cell death directly by activation of caspase 3. And, and, there, and if we did that, of course, that's the penultimate step in cell death, because these are the, these are the cell demolition experts that, that bring the cell down. So this talented postdoc in my group, uh, uh, Dennis Wolin, uh, carried out a high throughput screen using the small molecule discovery center that uh, Frank and Sue alluded to. Um, uh, and we screened um, uh, uh, ten thousands of compounds, actually about uh, eighty thousand compounds or thereabouts, and 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 found compounds remarkably that could activate the the the, the, the caspases. We show this here. We call this fifteen forty one. Uh, this is a small molecule that would have has drug like properties, molecular weights that are compatible with being a drug, obeys Lipinski's rules. We've done a lot of characterization of this compound that I won't have time to tell you about. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we're very excited about this is that this compound does, in fact, um, uh, induce cell death. So, for example, these cells here, this is a BT549 cell line. It's a breast cancer cell line that is missing P53. So it's missing the alarm bell. This cell line has already deleted <laughs> one of the, the key things that would be driving apoptosis. So we found, in fact, that our compounds, shown here in the, in the red here, over as a function of time, will potently kill these cells. And in fact, they'll kill them as fast as the most potent uh, known inducer of apoptosis, known as storosporin. Um, other drugs, for instance, this uh, atopicide, for instance, is a standardly used uh, chemotherapeutic. It's even more potent than that in terms of uh, time course to death. And, uh, um, and so we're very excited about this because it turns out that we found out that these compounds are broadly active in many cancer cell lines. They will bypass P53. Um, and moreover, we've, we've shown that they, they depend critically on the presence of caspase 3 in these cells. If you delete caspase 3, they don't kill. Why? Because they don't, we activate caspase 3 in these cells and it's critical for that process. So the, the sort of the elephant in the room is, well, Jim, but caspase 3 is present all over. Actually, it's not. Caspase 3 is distributed not uniformly in all the cells and is generally amplified in, in, in cancer cells. So when we look, for instance, at uh, 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 using uh, uh, the con uh, contortion that we're involved in, the MMTI, uh, 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 the Jeff Wolf runs, we've gotten so, uh, some cell lines in multiple myeloma. And we can show, for instance, that, that cell lines, this is a Belkate on the right, an approved drug, in fact, first line approved drug for, for myeloma. Um, uh, a normal, uh, it, it can kill a sensitive cell line, shown in, in red, or a uh, more resistant cell line. But it actually doesn't have a great therapeutic index. For instance, this cell line in, in blue is considered a normal plasma cell line. So um, uh, this Velcade does not have a huge therapeutic index. 
And we compare that with 1541, on the other hand, you can see that we get dramatic, you know, really nice protection with the normal cells, and but a dramatic killing with the two uh, cell lines, both resistant or um, uh, 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 or um, sensitive to the LK. So we're excited about this. We still, these are early days, but um, I'm, I'm really excited that uh, UCSF has provided us the opportunity to actually st uh, go after a novel mechanism, a no novel target, in a very, very different way than, uh, than what would be conventionally done. I then want to tell you a little bit about, um, uh, and Sue alluded to this, the need to understand the markers that are, ha that are, that are occurring when we treat uh, patients with cancer drugs. Can we tell them much sooner than we uh, currently do that the cancer drugs they're being treated with uh, are actually being effective? And so uh, this project is really uh, focused on that, uh, whereas uh, most uh, cancer patients, um, I'm running out of gas here with the, uh, the, the pointer, but um, uh, the idea is that when you treat with a cancer drug, you induce apoptosis actually within about 24 to 48 hours. But generally, people can't see if those cancer drugs have had an effect until usually a month or three months later because they have to use uh, uh, um, some sort of imaging technology against the tumor to see that it's actually shrunk. But apoptosis happens very fast, 24 to 48 hours. These products are being produced. Can we find out what these products are that are made so that we can develop assays to tell patients when they're treated with a cancer drug that drug has worked? Not only that, but that it's actually killed the cells that you hope the drug has, has, has gone after. So this is, has motivated us, is to find out what these things are that are being cleaved, and then develop assays. Oh, a new fancier one. Uh, I'm a little challenged on the button part here. I got, I got the, the, the spotlight to work, but I can't the, uh, oh, the lower button. Thank you very much. OK, so. Uh, so we wanted, we wanted to do this so we could, we could tell people early on if, they're, if the drugs are being effective or not. And Sue mentioned what these response rates are. They're, I mean, they're, they're impressive when they're 20%, but that means 80% is not working on. And for those, I maybe mean, we could tell them early on, hey, don't be taking that drug. Pick, take a different drug instead. So the, these cast phases are proteases. And what they do when, they, when, they under, when cells undergo cell death is that they cleave proteins into fragments. And we, what my group did, and I won't have time to go through the details of this, is that we developed a technology that allows us to tag these cleaved fragments. And by tagging those cleaved fragments, for instance, Sammy Maros, the postdoc who did this, the, 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 this work here, um, we can tag them with biotin and then pull out the, the cleaved proteins and then identify these cleaved proteins by mass spectrometry. And using this technology now, we've now identified a thousand targets that the caspases can cut in a given cell. So in tissue culture, we can show they cleave, can cleave about a thousand targets. Well, there's 20,000 genes not cleaving everything. Doesn't have to. Only about 5% of the genome is probably critical for its cell life. So it's cleaving that, that, that proportion. So having identified the, these, these products then, We've now been conducting uh, a clinical trial with patients being treated with chemotherapeutics to ask the question, can we find what are the cleave products that they are uh, generating, what are the caspase cleave products they're producing in serum? Um, uh, so apoptosis is kind of like a bridge demolition uh, process here. And uh, what we're interested in doing is identifying those products that get out of the cell um, that are cleaved and released into serum and stable enough so that um, we can then uh, uh, develop antibodies to those products and then use those products to actually detect um, uh, the, uh, that the, the drugs are actually having an effect. And I'm happy to say that just actually last week, we've got our first clinical uh, samples uh, of, a, of a multiple myeloma patient treated with uh, uh, um, uh, chemotherapeutic, and we've identified already 20 cleave products in serum that could be candidates for us to go after. So that, I think, is, it, I'm very excited about that and the prospect that that could have for um, uh, telling people that they're responding to, to the drug and, in fact, hopefully even what cells are responding. So what I've told you about is work that we're doing in triggering apoptosis through direct caspase activation. Um, this is a novel target and potentially a whole new class of cancer drugs. These are very early stage uh, 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 studies, I should emphasize. But um, uh, uh, I'm very excited about where they are at this point. 
and then uh, developing biomarkers for apoptosis to rapidly assess the chemotherapeutics in the clinic, both for patient stratification and response and for rapid clinical decision uh, for response. And lastly, I'd just like to thank um, those people in, in my group here, who I'm, I'm very proud of, talented group of postdocs and graduate students uh, who have done this work. And um, I guess uh, I'd just like to thank uh, you guys for the opportunity to come today. And uh, I guess we have a question and answer period now. Huh? Okay. okay, we do have 10 minutes for questions. Is there any, uh, any one of us or any, anybody else uh, in the audience can field questions? So.